This week marks the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the RMS Titanic, which I'm commemorating by making a dish from Titanic's second-class dinner menu, curried chicken and rice, on this episode of Gene Eatology. Hey there, how you doing? I'm Lloyd, and like many people with an interest in history, I've been fascinated with the story of the Titanic ever since I was a kid. And the entire idea behind this channel is to form a connection with people of the past through the exploration of food, so I thought it would be interesting to try and make something that Titanic passengers might have had for dinner on the night of the sinking, April 14th, 1912. I decided to focus on Titanic's second-class passengers when picking out what to make for this video, and then settled on curried chicken and rice because most of the other menu items on Titanic were thoroughly European or North American in origin, and I was interested to see what curried chicken might have been like on a British ocean liner in 1912. Unfortunately, there are no recipes from the Titanic's galley itself. However, I was pleasantly surprised to find that there were plenty of recipes for curried chicken and rice from cookbooks dating from the late 18 and early 1900s. I really shouldn't have been surprised, though. Um, after India was colonized by the British, who apparently lumped a wide variety of sauce-based dishes under the single name curries, Indian cuisine, or at least aspects of it, were quickly incorporated into English cuisine, which then spread to North America as well. As a result, there are a bunch of curried chicken recipes from around the time of the Titanic sinking, uh, ranging from simple dishes for frugal households, which consisted of little more than chicken, water, onions, and curry powder, to more complicated preparations that were probably intended for professional cooks. Now, I'm under no illusions that this recipe would be considered authentic by the standards of Indian cuisine. Uh, my understanding is that the curry powders and pastes that were sold in the UK and North America during the late 18 and early 1900s were more approximations of actual Indian spice blends or scaled back versions uh, to accommodate British palates. One curious aspect of many of these recipes is the addition of sour apples, which was apparently an attempt by English cooks to replicate the mango or tamarind powder commonly found in Indian cooking. Frankly, the history of curries and their relationship with colonialism, imperialism, etc. could be, and probably is, an entire book or series of videos presented by someone far more qualified to speak on the topic than me. I just want to make it clear. This is an attempt to recreate a Victorian or Edwardian era British recipe not to make an authentic Indian dish. I will not, however, be going with an apple-centric recipe. Instead, I chose a recipe from the 1911 version of The Modern Cook by Charles Elmay Francatelli. It seems to be a bit more complex of a recipe, and since even in second class on the Titanic, the food would have rivaled or at least been on par with nice hotels and restaurants of the day, Seems like a fitting choice. Now, this is going to be a little bit of an experiment for me, so we'll see how this goes. But for my version of Titanic's curry chicken and rice, you'll need one chicken in pieces. My nearest grocery store didn't have a whole chicken in pieces, and I was on a bit of a time crunch, so I just went with skin on chicken thighs. If you want to use like boneless, skinless chicken thighs, those would work well too. A tablespoon of curry paste. I'm using a homemade curry paste going off of an 1850s recipe recorded by Sir James Reynold Martin. I think it's probably pretty close to what commercially available curry pastes would have been like in 1912, and I'll be posting another video on how to make this in a little bit. But if you want to go ahead and use a store-bought or homemade modern curry paste, that would be fine too. One large onion, sliced. One small head of celery, chopped. One singular clove of garlic. Of course, modern, non-Edwardian palates, including my own, may enjoy more garlic than this, but I'm going to go with a single clove this time, just to stick with the original recipe. Plus, there's more garlic in the curry paste. A bouquet garni. This refers to a bundle of herbs, described in the modern cook as simply parsley, thyme, green onion, and bay leaf tied up with a string, uh, this is what I'm using, but if you're making this on your own, you can really bundle up whatever fresh herbs you'd like. One blade of mace. If you're not familiar with mace, it's the arrel or covering on nutmeg seeds. If you don't have any blades of mace, don't worry. You can substitute either a half teaspoon of ground mace or three quarters teaspoon of ground nutmeg. 
The flavor won't be exactly the same using nutmeg, but it should be close enough. Four whole cloves, one tablespoon of flour, one imperial pint or about two and a half cups of chicken stock, and a half tablespoon of ghee or clarified butter. Regular butter or cooking oil will likely work fine too. Then, over medium heat, brown your chicken in ghee or butter. Once the chicken is well browned, go ahead and remove it from the pot. Turn the heat down to medium low and add your onions, celery, garlic, cloves, mace, and herbs. And then just continue cooking until the onions are lightly browned. Then add the curry paste and flour. Mix together. Add the chicken stock and simmer for about 20 minutes. I realized too late that I forgot to film this part, but once the sauce has simmered for about 20 minutes, remove it from the heat and pour it into another pot through a fine sieve or strainer. Add the chicken and strained sauce back into the pot and simmer until the chicken is fully cooked through. I'd actually recommend covering the pot uh, while you're simmering. I didn't, and it took a while for the chicken to come up to temperature. And then in the meantime, prepare two cups of basmati rice to be served along with the chicken. So while the chicken curries, let me explain a little bit more about why I decided to focus on the second class menu. In media depictions of the Titanic disaster, especially the 1997 movie, uh, most attention is given to first or third class passengers, and it's understandable why that's the case. Uh, first class held some of the wealthiest and most famous people of 1912, names that are still recognized today. Astor, Guggenheim, Molson. Despite ourselves, the rich and famous, both modern and historical, still capture the attention of the everyday person. As for third class, we sympathize with the poor and immigrant passengers. The difficulties that third class passengers had making it to lifeboats that night are well known, and although there's no evidence that they were intentionally kept below decks, it still makes for damning examples of the classism and xenophobia of Edwardian society. Second class passengers are often overlooked, I think, because they're the nobodies between the ultra wealthy and the exploited poor, but frankly, Second class was as varied and interesting to me as any other category of person on board. Second class passengers came from all walks of life and from all over the globe. There were well-to-do businessmen who made frequent trips across the Atlantic. Architects, the servants of first class passengers whose services wouldn't be needed during the voyage. Clergymen, the families of missionaries heading home after years spent abroad. The Titanic's band traveled in second class, as well as multiple groups of Cornish miners headed for mostly Michigan and Montana. While second class was more British than any of the other classes, passengers also came from countries such as the US, Spain, Argentina, Italy, Finland, and Lebanon, just to name a few. The Titanic's only Japanese passenger, civil servant Masabumi Hosono, traveled in second class, as did the Titanic's only black passengers. Joseph Philippe Le Mercier Laroche, who was traveling with his pregnant French wife, Juliette, and their two daughters. Although educated in France as an engineer, racism prevented Joseph from finding suitable work, so he decided to move the family back to Haiti, where he could put his education and skills to better use. Originally planning to travel in first class on the SS France, the couple learned that the French line had a policy stating that children were not allowed to dine with their parents while on board. Understandably, the LaRoches found this unacceptable and instead booked second-class tickets on the Titanic. While Juliette LaRoche and their daughters, Simone and Louise, survived the sinking, Joseph, sadly, perished along with 92% of second-class men. That's a higher proportion than any other group, including the crew. However, while they were on board, the LaRoche family and other second-class passengers would have found accommodations, including the food, to be the equivalent of first-class on many other ships of the day. Though not as luxurious or as varied as Titanic's first-class spaces, second-class passengers would have had access to a comfortable and well-stocked library, a souvenir and barber shop, an oak-paneled and leather-upholstered smoking room, spacious promenade areas, and of course, the mahogany-appointed dining saloon, where the passengers would have dined on, among other things, curried chicken and rice. So, I wish I could report that it was a complete surprise, bursting with flavor, but sadly, that's not the case. It's not bad by any means, but for how 
pungent the curry paste was and for how many aromas that the sauce gave off while it was cooking, it's kind of bland. Like, the flavors that are there are good, I just wish there were more of them. And for the curry paste, having a full tablespoon of cayenne, it doesn't really have any heat to speak of, or at least I didn't think so. Now, it could be that the curry paste that the modern cook wanted us to use had packed more of a punch than Sir James's, or it just could be that Edwardian Anglo diners had less of a palate for spices than we do today. I think if I were to try this again, and I may because I have plenty of curry paste left over, I would double or even triple the amount of curry paste, garlic, mace, and cloves that I put into the sauce, and I'd also save some of the onions that we strained out and add them back in to serve with the chicken. I think they would add uh, some nice flavor. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this experiment and maybe learned a little something about second class on the Titanic and what those passengers might have eaten on their journey. If you'd like to try making Edwardian curried chicken for yourself, I've included the full recipe as well as a link to The Modern Cook in the description. It's available for free on Google Books. If you do give it a go, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear how it turned out. Thank you so much for watching. I've got a lot more recipes to share, so please like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Gene Eatology.